some others, but we'll get back to that next week. If you have your Bible right there and would turn with me, I'd like to continue our study in the book of James. James chapter 3. It's right after Hebrews, Paul. Just Paul was uh, sharing earlier. No, we appreciate Paul. Uh, make sure you're out 945 next week for Family Bible Hour. Paul has been teaching us uh, in the Word of God about heaven. And the more we talk about heaven, the more we, we, uh, we get it as a part of our life to look forward to being with the Lord. How tremendous is that? So we look forward to being with the Lord. So thank you, Paul, 945 next week. Let's pray as we turn to the, the scriptures. Lord, we thank you that though uh, things are not as they normally are here at church today with, with everything going on, we thank you for Labor Day weekend. We thank you for some that are traveling that can be with us and and others, Lord, may you bless them and encourage them and help them. Use them, Lord, in your work. May it be to your glory. We thank you that we can gather here today. Lord, bless us as we look into the scriptures today. As we look through uh, these 12 verses, if you don't come back and take us in the rapture first, uh, we anticipate getting down to verse 12. But help us to think about how we use our mouth, our words, how we're doing in relationships and that we would use our tongue in an honorable, God-glorifying, believer-encouraging manner, and that we would use our tongue to be a witness to the lost. In Jesus' name, may your spirit be here and be at work to show us truth, remind us of truth, lead us in truth for your glory. May, may the Holy Spirit and the Word of God be, a, as it were, a spring bubbling up into us unto eternal life, that eternal life will be in heaven someday, but eternal life is for today and tomorrow to walk with you right now. So bubble up, we pray, Lord, and do a work in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back to school is, is happening. I don't know when they start. I know down south, a lot of places have already started. They're back to school this week. Some are starting back with public school and with uh, even homeschooling here in New York. But uh, back to school, you know, when you go to school, you start off, and I know my kids have already been in college, they're talking about the syllabus and what's going to be required, reading, how many books they have to read, uh, ordering the books online, so forth. And uh, as, as they get these books, uh, the material, the, the, the reports that they're going to have to write, the quizzes, the tests, all of these things are going together because at the end, or, or th incrementally throughout the school year, what's going to happen? There's going to be tests. There's going to be grading. There's going to be a, a passing or a failing, right? And, uh, you know, if, if you don't make the mark, you don't get the credits, or you, you have to take the, the class over again, or the grade over again for, for uh, grade school kids. So uh, as believers, I'd like to talk about the grade and uh, your report card on the tongue. You okay with that? Your report card on the tongue. Is God keeping track? Does he see, see what's going on in our lives? He sure does. And uh, let's look at uh, James 1. If you, I know he got you to chapter 3. We're going to jump in there about the tongue. But let's do a little backup here. James 1.19, it says, folks at home too, I appreciate you turning in your Bible and worshiping with us. James 1.19, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, that's the challenge. Look down in verse 21, James 1, 21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Lay aside the filthiness and, and the wickedness that overflows. People around us, uh, you hear people driving down the road sometimes. I heard this car. These people were fighting in the car. And I thought, man, I can, I can just feel the stress. Is at a, the, the stoplight up here just yesterday? And the people were in there, and the hands were going. I thought, oh, my goodness, the overflowing of wickedness. Let's also look at uh, chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2 of James in verse 12. So speak... So speak and so do as those who will be, what's the next word? Judged, okay? We're going to be held accountable for how we're living. And God sees what we're doing. You know, God's given us a tongue, and one tongue and two ears. 
And uh, I read in a commentary, John MacArthur said that, uh, um, that the tongue's in a wet place and it, it might be slippery when wet, right? And uh, your tongue's liable to fall into saying things that are not right. And so we need to be careful about that with our tongue in a slippery way. Let's jump over to chapter 3 now. Now, James really cares about these things. And he confronts me. He says, my brethren. And uh, he's like, he wants to get up close and personal with you about this. He wants to come over and grab you and give you a hug and, and, and crank down on you with a big bear hug and say, hey, I've got to talk to you about something. He wants to get up close and say over, over a cup of coffee at the table maybe and say, hey, we've got to talk about something here. This is serious, and I want to get your attention. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. You see, there's accountability for how we use our words. And with teachers, apparently many people wanted to be speaking there and being teachers. But uh, in this, he warns them that they need to be careful about that. Uh, a teacher needs to be careful with his tongue, how he's using it. Because we have power to direct as teachers, we have power to direct other people's lives. Now, now, whether we have a position of, say, a teacher at school or a teacher at church, you know what? Men, we're to be teachers of our wives. We're to be teaching our wives the Scripture. We're to be helping them. We're to be the spiritual leaders in our home. We're to be teachers. And whether we're teaching in a formal setting or whether we're just teaching by example, we're teaching. I appreciate when I go visit my dad, 85 years old, and he has his Bible laying on the, the arm of his, of his recliner. He's got his Bible right there or up on the table right by him. And uh, still in the home, my parents, at 85. And he keeps the Bible there and he gets it down. And, and I said, Dad, are you, are you reading the Pennsylvania game news that I ordered for you and sent to you? He goes, well, yeah, thank you so much for that, and, but no. I said, oh, really? And he says, well, I have a hard time seeing it. And I, he says, I'm saving my eyes so I can read my Bible. I want to read the Bible. And he's got his Bible laying there. And before, you know, in the evening we're sitting around, but he gets his Bible out. And, he, and he, it's not a show. He, he's reading the Word. Why? You know what? He's teaching me. He's being an example to me. And I go, hmm, I wonder. I'm a pastor. I wonder. You know, he's not a pastor, right? He's home, sitting in the recliner. How much, how much have I read the Bible today? And so we're teaching by our example and by the life that we live, we're an influence wherever we go in society. The way we drive, the way we talk, the things that we do, the way we dress, the, the way we present ourselves, our attitude at work and in the home, we're teaching. We need to be careful about these things. A teacher must also be careful that they practice what they teach unless they be a hypocrite. Now, at the same time, we still need to teach things even though we may be struggling with them. Okay? Now, I'm not perfect, but I still need to preach the whole Word of God, right? And uh, even though I'm struggling with something, I've got to teach on that and preach on that. But we need to be careful uh, that we are endeavoring to be sincere. Because uh, if, if our life's not up to what it should be, we're going to be causing damage, saying one thing and living another. And, and kids quick get on to that, don't they? People around us quick can catch on to those things. The Word is powerful. But the vessel through whom it is delivered needs also to be a pure vessel, and it uh, will be delivered in power then. Well, it's also, um, we have the power to direct. Um, uh, it's an inclusive challenge here in verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. You know what? James is right there with him. He says we all make mistakes. We all stumble in many things. This, this is tough. We all stumble he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body, or a complete man, or a mature man. Somebody's mature if they're able to control their tongue. So we could say, how mature are you in your walk with the Lord? How well are you controlling your tongue? Now the importance of the tongue uh, comes out because it comes out of the heart, doesn't it? Anyone who doesn't use their tongue properly gives evidence that he cannot control his whole body. And he proves that he is an immature person. And we all have areas that we need to grow in, don't we? In World War II, there were signs posted that read, you probably heard this, loose lips sink ships. Loose lips sink ships. 
but also loose lips destroy lives and hurt brothers and sisters. They wreck lives. An unguarded statement and suddenly finds ourselves in a fight. Our tongue, maybe when we say something we shouldn't, shouldn't have said, we took our whole body with that little member, our tongue. It takes our whole body. Now maybe somebody's going to, wants to punch us. You know, if it was bad enough to say, right, if we really did something wrong. Somebody's going to attack us now. You shouldn't talk to my wife that way, right? And uh, that, that kind of a situation, right? So our little member, our tongue, can cause a lot of trouble. As we think about the, the, not only the teachers direct people, but we all do, but also a horse's bit in verse 3. It says, indeed, factually here, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. A little child can control a team of horses. I, I saw this little Amish boy, I don't know, three feet tall, you know, how big, right? And uh, this little guy who is up on this great big wagon of hay and these great big horses that their backs are like, you know, they dwarf me. And here this little, this little Amish boy, this little hat, is riding up on top of this, this load of, of hay, this great big wagon. These horses are, are, are marching along, dragging this thing. The power in, this, in the bit and the little bit, you know, isn't it interesting how God made horses? That's exciting because they got a space back here behind their teeth. Who thought of a bit in a horse's mouth anyhow? Well, we know it was going on in biblical times, right, with chariots and horse races and all that back in Solomon's day. But somebody thought to put a little thing on there that when you turn it, it gives a little pressure. And uh, it got the horse's attention. And there's different bits, different designs, and they... they uh, Basically, all work the same. They put a little pressure on the horse's mouth, and the horse goes, whoa, something's going on here, and they learn that they better pay attention. You know what? We need to have a bit in our mouth sometimes. Sometimes maybe we, we ought to just strap on a, a harness and close our mouth and let somebody steer us a little bit, that we would control ourselves and get ourselves where we need to be with our mouth. You say, Pastor, you've gone ridiculous now, right? But that's about it. We need to really take it seriously. That's what the Word of God says here. We can control horses with a bit. What does it say there? That they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Have you ever been to a horse pull? I love going to the fair to a horse pull. And my dad, when I was out in Ohio on our last vacation here a couple weeks ago, dad was telling me about one time a guy come down the road and he run his car off the road into the ditch. You know, in the olden days, things were a little different than they are now. And Raymond Sauerwein brought the tractor down. And he hitches on and he's going to pull him out. Yeah, I'll be right, take care of this. It didn't work. He says, I'll be back. Give me a few minutes. He went back to the house, got the horse team hitched up. He went down there and he hitched on. He says, come on, boys. And uh, those horses leaned. Can you picture it with me? Can you see all that bone and muscle? You know, horses aren't like fat, chubby things, right? Horses are muscle. And you, you can picture it. Like, I used to go to the Cookport Fair, and they'd, they'd hitch on the teams. They'd, they'd back them horses up, and, the, and their, their hooves would be going. They knew something was coming. And the guy was trying to back them up. Whoa, right? And he, they'd drop the hook into the load, and he'd jump out of the way. Yeah! And they'd take off, right? All that muscle and all that power controlled by a little bit. You know the big problems we have in life? You know our relationships? All that muscle and all that fervor, all those troubles at work or with your neighbor? Let's bring it back to right here. Let's bring it back to our tongue. If we will be careful and wise about our tongue with our attitude, with the words that we say, with the way that we address people when we address them, maybe sometimes we shouldn't say anything to calm ourselves down or to give it some time with them and, and how we approach them. It'll steer our lives around us by the grace of God. Of course, sometimes people don't respond to that, but we need to be careful with our tongue. The next example is what? A ship's rudder. Now, we sang about a ship in a couple of our songs and, and uh, thinking about the cable straining in the storm. And uh, uh, I should have brought a, a model in, right? I didn't have a model. Bring, bring them, I wish I'd had a horse bridle too, right? And uh, I'm, uh, where, where is it here? A, a great big ship, and back here's this little rudder at the back. Maybe you want to draw a ship there and put a rudder on it, right? And here's this whole ship. All they got to do is turn the rudder. It's amazing, isn't it? Let's read verse 4. 
Look also at ships. This is going on uh, when James wrote this. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. A rudder. Fighting the winds and the currents, the, the, the pilot of that ship on the wheel, or whatever devices they have today, hydraulic and electronic and all those things, is able to steer the ship and go the right way. So that though the storm come and try and push them off course, though the current is fighting against them, maybe they're going upstream, up a river, they can take it where they need to go. And God will help us with our work if we will use our tongue like a rudder and control what is said. Although they are large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Our human tongue is a small member, and yet it has the power to accomplish great things. We have an old nature that wants to control us and make us say things. Sin on the inside and pressures on the outside are seeking to get control of our tongue. But we have to say, I'm going to let God pilot me. I'm going to choose to control myself. I'm going to use my tongue to do what's right. We must be under the control of a strong hand, and we need God's help in life. When Jesus controls, speaks to us about controlling our tongue, he tells us, for out of the heart the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if our mouth is getting out of control, if our tongue is acting up, we need to say, God, I got a heart problem. I need to get into the word more. David prayed this way in Psalm 141, verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep a watch over the doors of my lips. David was praying about his mouth. He knew about the struggle he was having. How about you? Where's your tongue at these days? Are you praying about it? Psalm 18, 21, Solomon warns us, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What kind of fruit are you getting from your tongue? A rudder. Ananias and Sapphira, how were their words? They ended up dead, right? Same day. Their words. How about Jesus' words in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well of evangelism, right? Power of the words to change her life, to change it eternally, and to change the whole town there. Many that were saved. How about Peter's words on the day of Pentecost when he preached and 3,000 were saved in Acts chapter 2? The power of the tongue. What are you using your tongue for? Are you letting your tongue lie dormant? Wah. You're not using it for God at all? Hey, we need to speak up for God. Let's do something good. Like Peter, let's get the gospel out. We find also that you have the power not only to direct, but the power to destroy is in the tongue. Verse 5, even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest, of fi of a, forest a little fire kindles. I'm talking about the tongue here that can destroy. The tongue is little, yet great destruction, boasting and carelessness of speech, it can set on uh, fire the course of the world, the course of hell, the course of nature. Verse uh, 6, the tongue is a fire. It says, a world of iniquity. You see, it's, it's almost global. You think our little words don't mean nothing? No, it can hurt, and it can hurt people's lives for the rest of their life, for decades. We can hurt people with something that was said, and, and they carry that, and they, they feel bad about that, or maybe we feel bad about it because we regret saying it, because it maybe ruined a relationship. If, if we could just reach out there and take our words back sometimes, right? Or, or grab it and change our attitude and maybe say the same thing, but, but the way we say things, oh God, we need your help in this. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it def defiles the whole body. It smokes up, it stinks up the whole house. Our, 
our house burned down, the parsonage at my first church, and the stuff that we were able to salvage, it was black. It wasn't touched by the fire, but the smoke had permeated, and everything had this black, uh, like oily film where the plastics, you know, melted, the, the, the trim and all those things. It was a mess. And so our speech, maybe, maybe we say something here, but I'm telling you, the smoke, it defiles many. We need to take seriously our words. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on the fire of, by hell. Nature, it burns the whole forest. Did you know how much has been burning in California? Anybody at home know? You folks know? How many acres have been burned? As of yesterday, I looked this up last night, have been burned this year in California. It's just shy, get this, of 2 million acres. I tried to figure out how to describe that to you, and, and you know, from here to wherever. And I, Anyways, I gave that up. Figure it out, let me know, would you? 2 million acres. It's larger than Long Island. Think of that. Larger than than Rhode Island. Uh, it's, it's just amazing how much uh, land is burned. But, but it only takes a little spark. I, I look down, they have a listing of how the fires started. Many of them were started by lightning. Well, there you go. Some of them were started from hot embers, say from trains or automobiles, uh, steel, uh, hitting steel, and a little spark gets off, and, and uh, boom, the fire starts. Some of it, uh, many of them were unknown. But doubtless, some of the fires that start is because of man and our carelessness. But let us not set on the course of nature. Let us be mindful of the one spark that we can do something about. One time I was driving down the road and I looked, and I still wonder to this day what I should have done. But here's this fire burning. Somebody threw out a cigarette or something, and probably from here to the wall, uh, maybe here to the back of the auditorium, there's this, this little fire burn along the road, uh, kind of up the bank. I'm like, holy smokes. There's a fire back there. You know, everybody's just flying along. Maybe I should have stopped and got my floor mats out and tried to put this thing out. I don't know, right? But what about our tongue? Let's, let's stop it while it's small. Let's, let's... We got lips. We got teeth. We got jaw muscles to hold that tongue in there. Sometimes we just got to clamp it shut. Zip it, right? Button your mouth. Turn away. Look away. Say, God, help me. Because it'll set on fire the forest, it'll set on fire nature, it'll set on fire the world, it'll destroy iniquity, will abound because we didn't control our tongue. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is a tameable animal. Let's look at verse 7. Now, uh, it says here that some animal, that our tongue can't be tamed, but on down it indicates that we ought to control our tongue. We ought to control ourselves. So I'm saying this kind of tongue-in-cheek, right? Uh, a tongue is a tameable animal. In some degrees it says, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile, of, every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. It ought not to be so. And so I put on the, on the, on the handout here and on the screen, it is a tameable animal. The Word of God says you can't tame the tongue because you, we're so sinful and we're so vile, and these things ought not to be so. One day we'll be able to tame it. By the grace of God, when we get to heaven, the old man will be put off. We'll be made like Christ. But we can start taming the animal now as we become more like Christ. Think of all the animals that can be tamed. Pretty amazing, huh? And yet, what's the matter with man? You know, horses, with all that muscle, if they didn't want to listen, I mean, right? How are, how are you going to, like, wrestle a horse to the ground? I mean, even a pony. Even a pig. Did you ever, like... Catch the grease pig kind of a thing. It's hard enough, right? It's tough. But the tongue, why don't we take it as serious as this and fight against our words that get out of control? An unruly evil, it's called. It's restless and incapable of restraint is the idea. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. 
It brings death by the bite that comes out of the mouth as poison a serpent would bite someone. David says in Psalm 39.1, I said I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. That's how serious David took it. He says, I'm fighting against my mouth. Do you ever picture King David wrestling with his tongue? Young David out watching the sheep, fighting his tongue. He wrote that, Psalm 39.1 and following. He says, I was mute with silence. Verse 3, my heart was hot within me while I was musing. And then verse 4, he says of Psalm 39, Lord, make me to know mine end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days a handbreadth and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. So he gets his perspective on God. He's talking about his tongue, and, and he's fired up inside, and he knows it, and, he, and he's praying to God. And he says, I'm going to set a guard. I'm going to restrain my tongue. But he's, he's wrestling with that. He's, he wants to say something. He wants to do something. And, and his emotion's going to spill out harmfully. Oh, that we would be like David and, and start getting a... Help me to know my days. Help me to know that I'm frail. Help me to know that my days are limited. I've only got so many days to live here, Lord. I want to live them for you. I'm going to be with you, right? We're going to heaven. I don't want to act like the devil down here. The angels are watching. God's watching. I'm accountable. What kind of a grade am I going to get on the report card, so to speak? It's full of deadly poison. We have the same struggles, don't we? It's important that we yield our bodies a living sacrifice to God. Did you ever see where there was a forest fire, or where there was a home burned down? How many of you saw at home or here that you saw maybe on TV, on the news, houses that have been burned? I saw one. I mean, the whole house, there was, you could see the imprint of the houses from the sky. You could see the imprints of the homes and the automobiles and the garage and right down the street. Everything is burned right to the ground, right? That's what our tongue can do. It's so destructive. Wisdom calls us. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. Stop fighting. Stop being a tail bearer. Nothing's more harmful in a church than a gossip, than a tail bearer, than somebody that goes around yappity, yappity, yap, saying things that we shouldn't, tail bearing and hurtful. Thankfully, we don't have that here. Things are going great. Praise God. But let's be careful about that because even at the end of this service today, I could go back there and I could, did you know such and such? Oh, you need to pray for them. Now, wait a minute. We do need to pray for people, but we've got to be very careful about our motive. Are we part of the problem or are we part of the answer? God help us to be part of the answer. Proverbs 26, 21 says, As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Are you contentious? Are you hard to live with? Are you miserable? Are you mean? Are you grouchy? Do you come home from work rawr, growling? Do you get out of bed on the wrong side? No, you didn't get out of bed on the wrong side. You got a wrong attitude. We need the word, right? We're getting at it. Lord, help us with these things. We need to take them seriously. Well, let's look on down uh, here in our passage that... Uh, we not only have the power to direct with our tongue, praise God, let's direct right. We also have the power to destroy, but you have the power to delight when you bring glory to God, verse 9. Verse 9, with it we bless our God and Father. Now let's just stop there before we read the whole verse. Do we bless God? Did you sing to the Lord today? Have you talked to him in prayer? Are you bringing glory to God with your tongue? I just love that, don't you? I'm glad I can please God. I'm glad I can speak well to the glory of God. We can speak uh, a blessing to others. Let's keep reading here in verse 9, though. There's some negative comments. Uh, with it, we bless our God and Father. And with it, wait a minute. Does, is this right? With it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the image of God, the likeness of God, and we'll curse them. We're here today singing Amazing Grace. And then we've got there, you low down, dirty, no good. Is that how we are? 
Let it not be so. Let it not be so. Examine ourselves. This is a challenge for us to grow in godliness. Verse, verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Don't do that. Okay? When we speak, we need to speak a blessing. Is what you say bringing a blessing to those around you? Now, sometimes as a parent, we have to say things that maybe aren't a, a, an immediate blessing when we confront over wrongdoing or, or confront our brother or sister in the Lord. That's not a, it's not a particularly joyful moment or appreciate, especially when uh, discipline needs to be carried out. But, but it's, it's for blessing. It's the intent of blessing. It's confronting sin so that we can um, have a better future. So we want to bring blessing and, and not just be a, uh, be a curse to be around. He says, if you're doing these things, these things ought not to be so. Verse 11, when you draw from God, I'm calling it you draw from God, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? When we're drawing the water of the Spirit of God and walking in the Spirit to help us to live godly, that's going to be a blessing to people. Are you drawing from God? You have a, a, the power to delight people. You know, as, as uh, parents and as spouses, as, as, as Christians in the church, we need to be a blessing to each other. We need to encourage each other. Are you drawn from God? God will fill our cup. So when we're bumped, we spill out into the saucer. It's joy. It's, it's a blessing. Not, oh, why'd you do that? And thinking the worst of somebody else. And I know we have challenges and pressures, but may we uh, send forth fresh water. This little bottle right here, what does it say on it? Poland Spring. Would you rather drink Poland Spring water from Maine out of those, I think there's like, what is there, four springs up there? Or would you like, I should have brought another bottle, would you like to drink the um, purified water from the city of Rochester, pure, or, uh, you know, whatever city, right? You look on the back sometimes, uh, New York City purified water. Oh, okay, wow, right? I mean, what do you want, right? And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm taken care of here. Somebody regularly provides me every week with a Poland spring water. Uh, water. What kind, of a, what kind of a refreshment are you to people? Do they taste the chlorine and the fluoride and the whatever the filter mist? Or do you got the good stuff from God helping us to use our tongue to glorify him? Well, verse 12 says, when you give positive words. Let's look at verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? No. Or a grapevine bear figs? <laughs> Can you get oranges off of an apple tree? No. Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So he's saying we need to choose to do what is right, but at the same time it's saying maybe we're not what we, we think we are, and we need to examine ourselves because faith without works is dead, chapter 2, verse 17. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Maybe you're not really born again. Maybe that's the biggest problem. Maybe that's why we're not controlling our tongue. Maybe that's why we're cussing. Maybe that's why we're grumbling. Maybe that's why we're miserable to be around. Maybe that's why we're explosive. God help us. We need to get saved if we're not. And we need to live for him and walk in his ways by the grace of God. You know, our tongue can make a big difference. In 1855, Edward Kimball went into a Boston shoe store and led young Dwight L. Moody to Christ. The result was one of history's greatest evangelists a ministry that still continues today. One of the books I looked at this week, I turned it over, was from Moody Press, a reliable uh, publisher. The tongue has the power to direct others to right choices or to wrong. We need to be careful to direct people aright in what they do. If your words are not a delight in these ways, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? It's decision time. Time to get with it. Jesus said it's a heart problem. Deal with the heart first. Maybe you need to be reading the Word daily. Are you? I know, you know, Bible apps are good, and, and daily breads are good, and whatever's good, and the prayer journal's good. But are you reading the Word of God? Yes, do these other things. But are you in the Word of God? Is God speaking to you through the Word? Are you giving Him time? Are you giving a listening ear from your heart saying, God, what do you have to show me? 
and he will. That will change our heart and our life. And James, God's word is for us today in these matters. We find that there's some things that can change our words. I've, I've adjusted this from Warren Wearsby, had a list of 12 words. I added to it. Please and thank you. Those are words that can change us. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? When was the last time you said, I'm sorry? Will you forgive me? And waited for an answer. You see, it's not up to us. We have to say, will you forgive me? Do you say please? Do you say thank you? Do you say? You did a great job. Well done. Do you encourage people? Do you appreciate what they do, their effort? I appreciate you. I love you. When it's appropriate, right? Or the way it's appropriate. Qualify that. I love you as a, a brother in the Lord. I love you as a sister in the Lord, right? I'm praying for you. There's some words that will change your life. What else? You could add another one to that. What kind of words do you need in your home, in your circle of life? How are you doing serving God? Lord, we want to thank you for your word today. Thank you that we could spend some time here digging in and thinking about the tongue. It's an unruly member. Our tongue just, just uh, gets going sometimes, and it's hurtful, and, and we regret it, and we can't believe sometimes what comes out of our mouth. And, and boy, Lord, we, we need your help, and we want to walk in the Spirit and yield to the Spirit. Thank you that you're sanctifying us, that we're not what we used to be, and uh, that you're doing a work to make us more like you. Help us to live it out in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, are you ready? Are you making the grade? Let's uh, get ready for our report card. Would you stand with me? Let's sing Higher Ground. You want to sing another one?